The words from Zechariah recorded in Luke say, by the tender mercy of God, the light has broken upon us. We rejoice this morning that the sunlight has returned. The light truly has broken upon us. This is the second Sunday in the season of Epiphany where we focus on God's light coming among us and try to understand what the birth of Jesus really means for us. And so today we're beginning a series of worship services that will focus on the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. And we look forward to that among us. So welcome again here in person or whether you're worshiping online at a later time or today with us. Uh, We trust that the light of Christ will shine brightly in your life. As we gather here, we gratefully acknowledge that many other peoples have lived in this land before we did, and so we're grateful that the Anunnaki, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples once occupied this land and cared for creation, just as we are attempting to care for creation as well. And we desire to live faithfully and justly in our relationship with all peoples who share our history and our humanity. And this understanding of living justly and peacefully is part of the light of Christ coming among us. It's part of the epiphany that we, that we experience. As a congregation, there's many events happening throughout the coming weeks. So I want to highlight a couple of those things. Uh, first, um, our annual budget financial meeting is going to be held on January the 29th. That will be right after our worship service. Um, some coffee, some refreshments, I think, and then our annual budget meeting. So please, uh, please try to attend that. There are important budget decisions to be made um, every year and again this year. So please, uh, please be aware of that. So that's 14 days from today. Uh, a couple other events that I'll highlight here. Uh, youth group is having a Frankfurter feast. That is on January 22nd which is seven days before our annual budget meeting. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Kids for Christ are having a tropical island night on January the 30th. So that would be one day after our annual budget meeting. (laughs) And uh, save the date, the care team is planning a family day, a games day on uh, Monday, February the 20th, which is um, family day. And again, that is 22 days after our annual budget meeting. (laughs) This morning, we will have a Christian Ed time uh, for adults to reflect on uh, the sermon, reflect on Epiphany, reflect on the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly this morning, the Beatitudes of Jesus. So I hope you'll be able to stay and join that conversation as well. It'll be an informal conversation and uh, reflections on, on what you've heard and how you experienced our worship this morning. Now, as we enter the sacred space and time of worship, we do so with our eyes and our ears and our hearts wide open so that we might see and hear and also do what God is doing among us. So let's take a minute and quiet ourselves with the musical interlude. We're gathered here by the tender mercy of God, whose light is breaking upon us, giving us light when we sit in darkness, giving us hope in the shadow of death, and guiding our feet in the ways of peace. 
Please pray with me. Lord God, we gather with much joy today. Your light has come again in winter sunshine. Your light shines in the twinkling eye of both friend and stranger, and sometimes even our enemy. Your light shines in the words of scripture. Today, as we worship, we pray, give us your light that we might walk in it, for that is our desire as followers of Jesus. Amen. Please join the musicians who come and lead us in our opening hymn here in this place. Please stand as you're able. Our first scripture from the Old Testament is found in Psalm chapter 15. I'm reading from the message. The psalmist starts with a question for God, and then God provides the answer. God, who gets invited to dinner at your place? How do we get on your guest list? Walk straight, act right, tell the truth. Don't hurt your friend. Don't blame your neighbor. Despise the despicable. Keep your word even if it costs you. 
make an honest living, never take a bribe. You'll never be blacklisted if you live like this. I want to invite the musicians again for another song. Praise God, praise to God who reigns. Please stand again if you're able. <laughs> Let's sing together. Scripture reading uh, from the New Testament, from Matthew chapter 5, is a well-known passage. We call it the Beatitudes. And here Jesus is describing the blessings of God's kingdom. It's God's vision and God's intention for how we might live in the world. Describes the qualities of discipleship that would lead to restoration that God desires. We're going to have an opportunity to hear the scripture twice this morning. We're going to follow the ancient practice of Lectio Divina, which means divine reading. It's a slow and unhurried practice. This is not speed reading. But it helps us to, it's kind of like sunbathing if we talk about the context of light. So we'll hear the scripture reading twice. Um, and I know that for some of us, waiting in silence can be kind of awkward, but for others, it's kind of a, refresh, a refreshing time when the worship leader is not talking. So I hope you'll see it that way. As you hear it the first time, ask yourself, what word, what image, what invitation is God offering you this morning? When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. 
And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when all people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen again to these words of Jesus. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, is there a word an image or an invitation that God is giving you this morning. Take a moment and listen. Kara, please come and bring us the message. Here we are already at the midpoint of January. Hard to believe, isn't it? And I expect that most of us have already packed Christmas away for another year. Decorations and twinkling lights taken down and carefully stored away. This week on my travels, I noticed plenty of real Christmas trees at the end of driveways waiting for garbage pickup. While Christmas dinner leftovers are long gone, some of us might be still eating our way through Christmas baking and Christmas chocolates. And some of us may still have Christmas cards displayed with their beautiful images of Jesus' mother and father lovingly gazing at their newborn son their glowing halos matching that of the baby Jesus. 
Jesus of Christmas is baby Jesus in the manger. The scene permeates parental love, the gentle company of farm animals, shining star, little, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. The baby is safe, and we want to keep him there, don't we? He asks nothing of us but admiration. He demands nothing of us. And besides, we don't need to change at all. God incarnate, as illustrated on our Christmas cards, is predictable, definable, containable. And for many, this is the God we have grown up with. And while there is nothing wrong with holding tight to the Jesus of our childhood, the Jesus we grew up with is but a starting point because to remain at the manger is to limit God and limit ourselves. To remain at the stable, we limit our capacity for mystery and the unfathomable and eternal light and love of the divine. We limit Emmanuel, God, with us and our openness to transformation and growth as Jesus' disciples of healing and hope. Last week, I packed away our, night, our nativity scene. I retrieved baby Jesus from the roof of the stable because that's become the place where he rests since our grandson made that decision at age two. Shepherd and wise men were bubble wrapped, put away a lowly lamb, tucked away as were Mary and Joseph. As we read in the birth narratives, the shepherds who came to worship the Christ child didn't stay at the manger. They left with the news of a savior returning to their fields and flocks. And the gift-bearing magi who followed the star in time left with the news that a king and the reality the news of a king and the reality that the child was in danger from the tyrant Herod. In time, Jesus grew up, and scriptural details are sparse of his first 30 years of ministry. Jesus, the rabbi, the wise teacher, he matured, and his identity and God's mission became clarified, an invitation that we also receive from the divine. Our maturing from childlike faith of wide-eyed wonder and innocence to an adult faith opens the way for a larger, deeper, more expanded understanding of a savior who is both fully God and fully human. So over these coming weeks, we'll be digging into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And usually our homework assignment comes at the conclusion of the message, but not today. Here's your homework assignment. We want to read and reread and pray with Matthew 5 to 7. And it's my prayer that we will make this daily New Year's practice um, listening for God, that we will do this holy reading of Scripture. Now, according to Matthew's Gospel, after calling his first disciples, Jesus saw a crowd. And he went up the mountain and he preached his longest and most memorable sermon. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is an extended teaching that is descriptive and summons Jesus' followers to a new kind of life, God's kingdom life. As with his parables, Jesus' teaching focuses on helping us imagine what life looks like when we live according to God's will and God's way. Jesus' teaching discloses God's kingdom come and God's, God's kingdom coming in its fullness. As we prayed with Matthew 5 this morning, perhaps you've noticed, as I, that those named as blessed are hardly those whom we or our culture would consider blessed. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the humble, those who extend mercy rather than seek justice, or those who strive for peace rather than exert their will through violence or passive aggressiveness 
just to name a few. To set the historical stage, Jesus delivers these blessings to his disciples and others whose social and political context is the Roman Empire and whose religious context is the elite Jewish establishment. When Jesus teaches the Beatitudes, he is critiquing both contexts because of the groups upon whom these blessings are pronounced. Blessed are they, Jesus says. The Greek word used here is makarios, and it can be translated in a number of ways. In addition to blessed, it can mean happy or fortunate, well off. But perhaps the most satisfying definition in the context of Jesus' teaching to his disciples is blessing as favored by God. Favored by God. And having just celebrated Advent and Christmas, echoes of Mary's Magnificat, as recorded in Luke's Gospel, surely rings in our ears when we hear favored by God. In response to the angel's disruptive announcement, Mary saying, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor, that is with blessing, on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm, has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, has brought the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Mary's song, Mary the mother of Jesus, Young, unwed, marginalized as a woman in a patriarchal culture, received favor from God. According to God's economy, those who receive God's favor are not the privileged classes of the Roman Empire nor the elite Jewish establishment. Rather, the Beatitudes are spoken to those whom God deems worthy, not by virtue of their own achievements, not because of their status in society, not because of their strong work ethic, but because God chooses to be on the side of the weak, the forgotten, the despised. God chooses to be on the side of justice seekers and peacemakers and those persecuted because of their beliefs. God's reign is revealed for the sake of the world in which the unvalued are at last fully valued as human beings. And this is cause for us to take notice because none of these persons, particularly in the first half of the list, would be considered blessed by our culture. We live in a time when the blessings are given to those who succeed often at the expense of others or those whose coffers are padded on the backs of the poor. To be poor in spirit, in other words, broken, or to be peaceful, merciful, or humble, will get you nowhere in a culture grounded in competition and fear or individualism and corruption. Jesus' teaching is literally turning the values of the world upside down. From the rise of a gentle hillside, Jesus introduces this upside-down nature of God's reign on earth as it is in heaven. This is a sermon that sets the stage, illustrating God's earthly mission and ministry. And in the gospel stories that follow, the word made flesh is an active participant writing this ongoing story of God's grace and God's kingdom values, which include having dinner with despised tax collectors, even sex workers and Sadducees, and ideally at the same time, forgiving the sins of basically everyone 
without even going through a proper verification process, and then touching both lepers and Roman soldiers as if they were holy. Jesus entered the story about how we humans thought this much indiscriminate mercy didn't sound right to us. And this mixing of people who shouldn't mix didn't sound right to us. And while we admire this instruction and the teaching, we may fear the implications. For Anabaptists, discipleship is a core value for faith community living. And a temptation in our vigor for faithfulness is to quickly turn to the practical, asking, well, how do we put Jesus' words into actual practice? Well, it is now nearly 2,000 years since Jesus' teaching, and we want to see Jesus' words and way making a difference in the world. We want to join with God to further God's mission. So this makes this more urgent, even as we continue to see injustice in the world, polarities and divides widening, inequity between the wealthy and the poor ever expanding, corruption and injustice rampant. Last February, Alvin and I took our twin grandchildren to Toronto for a weekend in celebration of their 10th birthday. Early on a frigid Saturday morning, we headed by foot for our day's adventures, including Ripley's Aquarium. We passed by a large inner city church with fenced yard, and we noticed a man asleep on the cold concrete sidewalk outside the borders of the church property. We walked under an overpass, past tents with boots set neatly outside the entrance. Well-worn blankets shrouded the threadbare structures, one lined up after another, just mere feet from busy traffic lanes. Our grandchildren were horrified, absolutely horrified, to witness unsheltered persons in frigid temperatures, and boy, did their questions ever flow. Why are they sleeping outside? Where do they shower, they asked. Where and what do they eat? How do they stay warm? Just a few weeks ago, my granddaughter and I traveled into Waterloo, and I pointed out where the small houses are designated to be set up for some of our unsheltered folks of Waterloo region. And in light of her experience in Toronto, Kendall thought, this is great. And then we talked about this settlement being located right beside the landfill site as we were driving by it. And suddenly, Kendall's delight turned to deep sadness. Nana, she said, I thought it was a good idea until you said where they're going to live. I have another story to share for you during Christian Ed, so stick around. We witness tremendous need in the world, don't we? We witness injustice. We witness suffering and more. Friends, the Beatitudes are not direct calls to action, to become poor in spirit, to mourn more, or to become more humble. And this may sound harsh to our discipleship-mindedness and to our discipleship ears. To embrace the Beatitudes as a rigid to-do list is to risk drifting into legalism rather than righteousness. The Beatitudes are not a moral checklist, nor list of ethics, nor exhaustive list of Christian discipleship. Rather, the Beatitudes are promises of God. Promises of God. Blessed are those who mourn. We know all too well how the loss of a loved one can bring us to our knees in grief. Loss through death, relational fractures. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. In this teaching, Jesus also has in mind that those who mourn are the faithful who recognize that the present condition of the world is far from God's purposes. 
Those who mourn see the injustices in the world, the exploitation, the inequality, the violence, the unsheltered. And this beatitude promises that they will be comforted. We will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for we will see the reign of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God. What situation in the world today calls for deep and sorrowful mourning? The violence of war, corrupt systems, corrupt institutions, the inhumane way humans treat one another, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Who is it through whom you can see past their brokenness, feeling their pain, their lostness, their humanity? Through whom do you see the very face of God? And when have you been poor in spirit? In other words, broken. Whether broken in spirit, relationally, emotionally broken due to a health crisis? How do you experience blessing through the care and the compassion of God? In the deepest places of your need and brokenness, how do you experience God's blessings as so rich as to say, blessed am I? Blessed are the meek, that is humble, where do we witness humility as powerful? Blessed was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Blessed was Joseph. Blessed are the unsheltered. Favored by God are those who sleep under overpasses. Favored by God are those living with addiction, mental illness, the unemployed who rely on food banks and out of the cold programs. Favored by God are the underemployed who receive warm hospitality and food boxes at the food cupboard across the street on Thursday evenings. And blessed are social workers and neighbors and others who see the humanity of the most vulnerable in society. Blessed are the gentle-hearted who choose kindness over lashing out, harming, through harsh words or actions. Blessed are leaders who do not abuse their positions of power, but rather who serve, rather than are being served. Blessed are those whose hearts overflow with compassion and whose actions are peace-building, the kind of peace that furthers justice. Blessed are they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those whose maturing growth develops from an inner transformation to outer transformation through the Spirit. Those who mourn injustice become those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and are transformed to become even more merciful. The blessed are transformed with pureness of heart and become peacemakers, peace builders. There's a progression in this list of Beatitudes. Rather than approaching the Beatitudes as a spiritual to-do list, let's consider when we are in difficult situations that we too have God's favor, God's attention, God's care and concern, God is never the source of suffering, but rather source of blessing, supporting, caring, seeing, blessing. Jesus doesn't say that being in a place of brokenness or mourning is a blessing, but rather that God blesses those who are caught in these states. When Jesus shared the Beatitudes, he provided us with a set of lenses that we might experience and witness God's blessing and light in the world and in ourselves, blessed to be a blessing. 
So in response, we are invited to stand in Jesus' place, proclaiming that those whom Jesus names blessed, no matter their situation, are seen and loved and favored, even when they may not see that within themselves. So blessed are the beloved of God. Blessed are the image bearers of God. Blessed are they, and blessed are we, as we grow and are formed and imagine what life looks like when we're living according to God's will and God's way. Blessed are we who embrace God's upside-down kingdom, for this is who God has created us to be. Amen. Song of Response is found in the green book that you'll find on your seats, number 94. Turn to Blessed Are They, and let's stand to sing together.
Thank you for the message, Kara. I jotted down lots of questions for our Christian education time. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Generosity is at the heart of Emmanuel, the heart of God with us. And so, as followers of Jesus, we, des we desire to imitate God's generosity with practices of giving, of sharing. Um, giving our offerings is really a spiritual discipline, a practice. So whether you give your finances electronically or put it in the basket at the back of the entrance, um, we want to say thank you for, for sharing your finances, your talents, your time with, with the church so that God's work can continue among us and through us. So join me in, in a prayer of gratitude for God's abundance among us. God, you have given out of overflowing abundance. You've given even your son, Christ, who gave his life freely. We gratefully receive the resources that you have given to us, resources of the earth to create prosperity. We receive the wisdom of your mind to create clear direction. We receive the talents that you give our hands so that we can bless others in the world. All of these gifts we receive from you, and all of these we turn back to you, offering them with joy and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come before God together, I would invite us into the Beatitudes again in prayer, into their surprising blessings and their bold proclamation of the kingdom. Throughout generations, the followers of Jesus have relied on these seemingly simple words to guide our lives, to help us understand God's will, and to direct us into prayer and for the sufferings of the world. So this morning, as we gather our prayers, I will read each blessing and invite you to repeat it. So keep this in front of you. We're going to go through each one with a prayer. And I will suggest a brief focus for our time of silent prayer. So I will say the blessing. You will repeat it. I will offer uh, a focus for reflection and prayer and move on to the next one. So let's come before God in prayer. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord Jesus, you see past our achievements, status, and work ethic, choosing to be on the side of the weak, the forgotten, the despised. Your gaze is upon the broken, broken of heart, body, spirit. Reveal yourself to the poor in this world, for whom the kingdom of heaven often seems distant and unattainable. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Comforting God, draw near to those who are mourning, who have lost someone or something dear to them. Draw near to those who mourn the injustices of this world, such as issues of hunger, homelessness, corruption, we pray for the blessing of comfort to strengthen us. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. We praise you, Jesus, for your example of humility. We strive to be more like you every day, but our pride often gets in the way. Our stubbornness and our selfishness too. Rescue us from pride, we pray. 
and help us to walk the path of humility. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Fit us, we pray, to call attention to the injustices in the world that abound. Strengthen us to work together in support of ministries of justice. May your spirit transform us through our active participation, feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, caring for creation. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Lord God, you are merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love, compassion, and truth. Be merciful to us, our families, your church, and those who stand in a place of need. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We pray for a heart that desires nothing more than to abide in you, your love and your light. Open the eyes of our heart to your presence in our lives and in your world. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Lord, make us instruments of your peace, generously sowing love, injuring pardon, living faith boldly. Where there is despair, may hope abound, where darkness dwells, may your light of love break through. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Around the world, many Christians are persecuted, imprisoned, even killed for their faith. Be their rock, their safety, their peace. And may their witness be strengthened. Emmanuel, God with us as we continue on this journey with you and with one another, may we live into your blessing and be a blessing in your world. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Stand and sing together our closing hymn, move in our midst and remain standing for the blessing.
Just as God has moved in our midst now, may God also go with you, teaching us all to love with heart, soul, and mind, keeping us strong until we gather again. Amen.